is being recorded. Welcome to the Unitarian Church in Fall River, where we think religious questions are important, but we want to work out our own answers, where we gather to share ideas and support one another. Sometimes the door shuts too much and someone is locked out. And it was Deborah who was locked out. Deborah, we're sorry we locked you out. We didn't mean it. We gathered this hour as people of faith, having sorrows and joys and needs and gifts. We like this beacon of hope as a sign of our quest for truth and meaning and in celebration of the life we share together. Can we join please in what has come to be known as the Black National Anthem or the Black National Hymn, uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing, number 149. Thank you. 
Are there announcements? She stopped coloring her hair and she looks terrific. She does. Ann Fox, the preacher next week. My short invocation is by David Bumba, who uh, was ordained a universalist minister. So that means he was ordained before 1961, which was when the Unitarians and the Universalists combined forces. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences, beneath all our diversity, there is a unity which makes us one and binds us together forever. In spite of time, in spite of death, in spite of the space between the stars. And I have a brief prayer, I think composed originally, I like this a lot, 
by Wally Bush. I don't know if any of you remember Wally Bush. He was the district executive of the of the, 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 the churches in this part of, of the United States back in the early 70s, I think. Can we please be joined in a spirit of prayer or meditation? God, when we speak your name, you know that each of us means something a little different and that some of us scarcely know what we mean or whether we mean anything at all. Prevent us from creating you in our own image. Help us to find you deep within our own being, in our relationship with others and with nature. Help us to hear in the worst, the cry for the best. Help us to feel that all our struggles are shared. Help us to help one another along the path of life, not merely by getting through, but by getting up. And whatever else we receive in this hour, may we be touched by some assurance that there is good yet to be. Amen. And now let us be silent together to create an opportunity for prayer or meditation. congregations are independent. We have a service organization, though, in Boston called the Unitarian Universalist Association. And the current officials there um, don't seem to have completely gotten over their Catholic pasts, and they're starting to behave in a kind of authoritarian way. And, and this won't last long. It can't. But, but um, it made me, made me think of a speech that Frederick Douglass gave in 1860, right on the, the doorstep of the Civil War. The, uh, the, these authoritarians in Boston are, are pushing a particular approach to racial justice and they won't discuss it. This is the issue, they won't discuss it. They're not respecting free speech. So here's Frederick Douglass, perhaps the greatest anti-racist and civil rights hero our country has ever produced, quite possibly greater than MLK, uh, talking about free speech in Boston in 1860. And when I read this, um, I say to myself, take that, you, you. <laughs> but independently of that, it has very interesting things to say about free speech. There's a, there's a, a perspective here I've never encountered before. 
So these are just excerpts from this speech. We thought the principle of free speech was an accomplished fact. Here in Boston, if nowhere else, we thought the right of the people to assemble and express their opinion was secure. Dr. Channing had defended the right. Dr. Channing was the leader of the Unitarians. Mr. Garrison, the famous abolitionist, uh, Mr. Garrison had asserted the right and Theodore Parker, who was a Unitarian minister who was a, a heroic abolitionist and Theodore Parker had maintained it with steadiness and fidelity to the last. Theodore Parker had just died when Frederick Douglass was giving this speech. But here we are today contending for what we thought was granted years ago. Last Monday, a meeting assembled here in Boston to, to discuss the question, how shall slavery be abolished? The meeting was invaded, insulted, captured by a mob of gentlemen and thereafter was broken up and dispersed by the order of the mayor who refused to protect the meeting, though called upon to do so. The leaders of the mob were gentlemen, not ruffians. They were men who prided, prided themselves upon their respect for law and order. These gentlemen brought their respect for law with them and proclaimed it loudly while in the very act of breaking the law by disrupting the meeting. Theirs was really the law of slavery, the law of free speech and the law for the protection of public meetings they trampled underfoot while they greatly magnified the law of slavery. No right was, de was deemed by the fathers of our government more sacred than the right of speech. It was, in their eyes, as in the eyes of all thoughtful men, the great moral renovator of society and government. Daniel Webster called it a homebred right. He was a senator from Massachusetts at the time. Daniel Webster called it a homebred right, a fireside privilege. Liberty is meaningless where the right to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. That of all rights is the dread of tyrants. It is the right which they first of all strike down. They know its power. We are told that the meeting that was to be held on Monday was badly timed and that the parties to it unwise. Why, what's the matter with us? Are we going to excuse a flagrant outrage on the right of speech by implying that only a particular description of persons should exercise that right? Are we at such a time when a great principle has been struck down to quench the moral indignation which the deed excites by casting reflections upon those on whose persons the outrage has been committed? After all the arguments for liberty, which Boston has listened to for decades, has Boston yet to learn that the time to assert a right is the time when the right itself is called in question and that the men of all others to assert it are the men to whom the right has been denied? There can be no right of speech where any man, however noble or however humble, however young or however old, is overawed by force and compelled to suppress his honest sentiments. Equally clear, and this is what I'm about to read is the innovation, the thing I've never heard said before, Equally clear is the right to hear. To suppress free speech is to do a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. It is just as criminal to rob a man of his right to speak and hear as it, is, as it would be to rob him of his money. 
I have no doubt that Boston will vindicate this right. But in order to do so, there must be no concessions to the enemy. When a man is allowed to speak because he's rich and powerful, it aggravates the crime of denying the right to the poor and humble. The principle of free speech must rest upon its own proper basis. And until the right is accorded to the humblest as freely as to the most exalted citizen, the government of Boston is but an empty name and its freedom a mockery. A man's right to speak does not depend upon where he was born or upon his color. The simple quality of manhood is the solid basis of the right and there let it rest forever. I'm aware that this is all very gendered. He talks about human beings as men, you know, all the time. But I, I you know, it's, I don't want to change the, the wording of something written in 1860, but I, I hope you can make that substitution as you listen. Frederick Douglass is a hero of mine, and I'm, I'm sure you know things about him, and I don't assume you don't, but I'd like to talk about him anyway. Uh, that's his picture on the cover, taken, I don't know, when he was about 60, probably. He, he lived to be 77. He was a striking man. Uh, they say he was the most photographed person in the 19th century in this country. He was striking looking. Uh, his mother was uh, a black slave in, on a plantation in Maryland on the eastern shore of Maryland. His father was her owner, a white man named Bailey. So he was Frederick Bailey when he was born. At a time when the average man was as tall as I am, he was over six feet tall. That added to his being so striking. He was striking in person. No, no one who ever heard him speak ever forgot it. 
Uh, in quick outline, his life was he was born a slave. He escaped to the north when he was 20. Uh, he became a speaker, uh, originally opposing slavery and later adopting other causes, uh, the rights of women, for example, and fighting Jim Crow laws, etc. He was an author, wrote several books, including three autobiographies, one of which I'll read from. He was a newspaper editor and publisher in Rochester, New York. And uh, toward the end of his life, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he became a, a civil official in the Washington, D.C. government. And right at the end of his life, a diplomat. He was the United States envoy to Haiti. And uh, the house he lived in, in Washington, D.C., is there and is open to the public, if you're ever interested. He's a hero of mine for three reasons, his accomplishments, the keenness of his mind, and the depth of his character. His accomplishments, I'd like to talk about them first. He was born, as I said, on a plantation um, on the eastern shore of Maryland. He um, was born in 1818. Uh, it's genealogists and historians who know that. He thought he was born in 1817 because when he asked his mother when he was born and he was, you know, six or seven, she guessed and got it wrong. He thought he was born in 1817. So he spent his whole life thinking he was a year older than he was. And his mother told him he was born in February, but she couldn't remember the day. So he chose Valentine's Day as his birthday. This is from his first uh, autobiography published in 1845 when he would have been, uh, just a minute, 27, 27. I never saw my mother to know her as such more than four or five times in my life. And each of those times was very short in duration and in the middle of the night. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart her owner uh, rented her out to another person. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart who lived about 12 miles from my home. She made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand. I do not recollect ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me only in the night, get me to sleep. But long before I waked, she was gone because she had to be back by sunup. Very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended what little we could have while she lived and with it her hardships and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old. One more excerpt about his early days on that plantation. This is until he was eight, between the ages of, between birth and eight. I suffered much from hunger, but much more from cold. In hottest summer and coldest winter, I was kept almost naked. No shoes, no socks, no jacket, no trousers, nothing but a coarse linen shirt reaching only to my knees. I had no bed. I would have perished with the cold, except that on the coldest nights, I would steal a bag that they used for carrying corn to the mill. I'd crawl into the bag in their sleep on the cold, damp clay floor with my head in the bag and my feet sticking out. My feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I'm writing now might be laid in the gashes in my feet. 
when he was eight, he was lucky. His uh, owner, the owner of the plantation, didn't need him on the plantation, but had a distant relative who lived in Baltimore, in town, and he needed some help. So Frederick Bailey was sent to Baltimore to work for this other person. And there, for the first time in his life, he ate his meals at a table. For the first time in his life, he slept in a bed. And he learned to read. Uh, in his autobiography, he talks about how slave owners were terrified of having slaves learn to read. And, uh, and he, he, here's a long quotation in which uh, he's, he's putting, he, he's recording the attitude of this Baltimore master. If you give a nigger an inch, he'll take an L. Uh, today we say if you, give, if, if you give him an inch, he'll take a yard. An L is an old fashioned measurement. It's, it's about the distance from your elbow to the end of your fingers. So it's about 18 inches. If you give him an inch, he'll take an L. A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he's told to do. This is, this is the master talking, but in Frederick's recollection. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. If you teach that nigger, and he was referring to Frederick, th th this master was speaking to his wife who had started to teach Frederick the alphabet. This was uh, a recent marriage and this woman didn't know that slaves weren't supposed to be taught to read. If you teach him how to read, there'll be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. He would at once become unmanageable and of no value to any master. And as to himself, it could do him no good, but a great deal of harm. It would make him dis discontented and unhappy. But it was too late. Frederick knew the alphabet. And this is, this is later in his autobiography. The first step had been taken Mistress, in teaching me the alphabet, had given me the inch, and no precaution could prevent me from taking the L. The plan which I adopted, and the one by which I was most successful, was that of making friends with all the little white boys I met in the street. As many of these I could, I converted into my teachers. With their kindly aid, with their kindly aid, obtained at different times and in different places, I finally succeeded in learning to read. When I was sent on errands, I always took my book with me. And by going one part of my errand quickly, I found time to get a lesson before my return. I used also to carry bread with me, enough of which was always in the house and to which I was always welcome. For I was much better off in this regard than many of the white children in my neighborhood. This bread I used to bestow upon the hungry little white kids who in return would give me the more valuable bread of knowledge. He learned how to read. In particular, he came across a book in his master's study. He'd have to, to sneak it, but it was called The Columbian Orator. And it was a collection of speeches by famous people uh, going back to Roman times and including much, uh, much more recent things. And uh, he got a lot of ideas about citizenship and government and, you know, philosophical ideas. Um, and he would read these speeches aloud and, uh, and become articulate while absorbing the ideas of the speeches. When he was 14, he had a bad break. He was sent back to the plantation, to a different plantation, to a different master. And he was there for four years. And this was the worst time in his life. We were worked in all weathers. 
it was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. The longest days were too short for master and the shortest nights too long. I was somewhat unmanageable when I first went there, as you could imagine. But a few months of master's discipline tamed me. He succeeded in break, breaking me. I was broken in body, in soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed. My intellect languished. The disposition to read departed. The cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me and behold, a man was transformed into a brute. But he lucked out again. He was sent back to Baltimore to the same place at age 18. And he acquired a trade. He became a caulker, C-A-U-L-K, someone who uh, pushed his caulking into the seams of boats. And he was working at the shipyard in Baltimore and bringing his salary home and giving it to the master. At 20, he escaped. He had gotten to know a free black woman named Anna Murray in Baltimore um, with whom he fell in love. She helped him get a train ticket and a phony ID. And because he was well-spoken and because he could read, because he could read the railroad schedule, he could read the newspaper, because he could forge a phony letter on his own behalf, assuring the reader that he was free. He escaped by just getting on the train and uh, going to New York City. That was it. He got on the train at age 20. And there, Anna was waiting for him. And they quickly married and immediately got on another train and came to New Bedford, Massachusetts. They didn't linger in New York at all. They came to Massachusetts. They spent four years in New Bedford and three in Lynn. Um, they chose those cities because those cities were run by Quakers. Uh, New Bedford then might have been the most prosperous city in the country in terms of per capita income. And it, it was controlled by Quakers who were the first uh, Protestant denomination, the first denomination to oppose slavery. And so they, it was a safe place to be an escaped slave. And Lynn also was controlled by Quakers, which is why he went to Lynn. And after that, after leaving Massachusetts, uh, he went to Rochester, New York, another city controlled by Quakers. It was while he was in Massachusetts, he became the Frederick Douglass we read about in history books, beginning with his name. Uh, he lived in New Bedford for the first year or so with uh, Nathan and Mary Johnson. They lived at 21 7th Street, and that house is on the National Register of Historic Places today. And it's owned by maybe the New Bedford Historical Society or, or uh, some organization like that, I'm not sure. Uh, Nathan and Mary Johnson were fierce abolitionists. They were free black people, but they were fierce abolitionists. Their house was a home on the Underground Railroad, which is what he was doing there with his new wife. Uh, Nathan said to him, you gotta, you gotta change your name. You're Frederick Bailey. Uh, slave catchers will be after you. They'll be looking for Frederick Bailey. And so Frederick uh, Bailey changed his last name to Douglas. And it was uh, Nathan Johnson who suggested Douglas. Nathan Johnson was reading Sir Walter Scott's novel, Lady of the Lake, whose hero is named Douglas. And uh, so Frederick took Douglas as his last name, and he added an extra S because, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Douglas is in Maryland, spelled it with two S's at the end. So he added another S. The Johnsons were not Quakers. They were Universalists. The Universalists was, were the second 
denomination to outlaw slavery. The, the Universalists uh, passed a resolution opposing slavery in 1794, which is very early for an American religious group. Uh, the Unitarians, by the way, never passed a resolution opposing slavery. Though the Unitarians produced a lot of heroic abolitionists and, and slavery fighters. Uh, the Johnsons, Nathan and Mary, knew William Lloyd Garrison, the abolitionist from Boston. They subscribed to his paper, The, Lib the Liberator. So through the Johnsons, Frederick Douglass got to know uh, Mr. Abolitionist in Massachusetts, William Lloyd Garrison. And at, at uh, the urging of Garrison, Frederick began to speak at anti-slavery gatherings, first to all black groups, groups of just free black people. Well, free black people and some escaped slaves who were incognito. <clears throat> Beginning in 19, in, excuse me, in 1841, by now, uh, he and Anna were not living with the Johnsons anymore. They rented part of a house on Elm Street in New Bedford for the, re for the rest of their stay in New Bedford. In 1841, uh, he uh, joined some other abolitionists from Boston uh, and went to an anti-slavery meeting on Nantucket. And there he spoke to a mostly white audience for the first time. And uh, they were impressed, you know, they didn't expect a black man, a black man, even a free black man to uh, be articulate. And uh, I'd like to read you, uh, this is the beginning of, uh, of several years where Frederick was speaking to anti-slavery groups in Eastern Massachusetts. And I have uh, an interesting excerpt from the Hingham Patriot. He, he spoke in Hingham. And uh, the editor of the Hingham Patriot, speaking about Frederick Douglass, said, he's very fluent in the use of language, choice and appropriate language, too, and talks as well, for all we could see, as men who've spent all their lives over books. He's forcible, keen, and very sarcastic. And considering the poor advantages he must have had as a slave, he is certainly a remarkable man as indeed he was. In 1845, he published uh, the book, the, the autobiography from which I've been reading. It's just called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. This is the first of his autobiographies. But with this publication, uh, he got a target on his back. Okay, now the slave catchers knew who he was and they were looking for him. And he went to Europe and spoke to anti-slavery groups in England and Ireland and Scotland. He was there for a year and a half. And he so impressed people there on his European tour that a Quaker couple, Ellen, no, not a couple, Quaker sisters, Ellen and Ann Richardson in 1846 bought him. They, they tracked down his, man, his master, his owner, in Maryland and paid the man $711.66 for Frederick Douglass. And then of course they said to Frederick, you're free. So he became free and it was safe to return to the US. Uh, he had uh, spent four years in New Bedford, three years in Lynn. And now in 1847, he went to Rochester, another Quaker city where he started his newspaper, which was called the North Star. It was an anti-slavery newspaper. And, uh, and he published books and so on. And I'll pass over the rest of his life. But as I said, he, he, uh, after the Civil War, he went to Washington DC where he worked in the city government and ended his career as a diplomat uh, representing the US in Haiti. Those are his accomplishments. That's, um, I, I said three things impressed me about him. His, his accomplishments, his keenness of mind and his character. I'll be much more brief on these other two. Um, I guess here's, here's just one example of uh, what struck me about his keenness of mind. It's, it's an analysis of racism. He's now writing in 1855, so he's 37. 
The slaveholders with a craftiness peculiar to themselves by encouraging the enmity, the, you know, the unfriendliness uh, of the poor laboring white man against the blacks. The slaveholders succeeds in making the white man almost as much a slave as the black slave himself. The difference between the white slave and the black slave is this, the black slave belongs to one slaveholder, but the, the, the white man belongs to all the slaveholders collectively. The white slave has taken from him what the black slave has, has, has been, bleh, what the black slave has taken from him directly. Both are plundered, both the white man and the black slave. And by the same plunderers, the slave is robbed by his master of all his earnings above what's required for his bare physical necessities. The white man is robbed by the slave system of the just results of his labor because he's flung into competition with the class of laborers who work without wages. His character, his character impresses me. When he was in New Bedford, he had it made. He had it made. He was, he was uh, an escaped slave, but he was pretty safe in New Bedford, especially with his new name and his network of, of uh, supporters. He had it named, he had it made, but he started speaking in public, right? He made himself known. He took the risk of being apprehended by a slave catcher. When he got back to the US and went to Rochester in 1847, he had it made again. He was free, he was free now. But he started this newspaper and became this, this publisher. In 1865, slavery is finally over. He had it made again. He spent the rest of his life fighting for uh, other civil rights issues, for fighting segregation, fighting racism in all its forms, fighting for women's rights, the women's right to vote. Um, he fought segregation, yeah, in segregation in churches and schools and public accommodations and transportation. When he was still in Lynn, um, one day when he was in Lynn, he, was, he, he wanted to come to Boston to attend a meeting and he got on a train and he was told by the conductor this is before the Civil War now. This is back when he was still in Lynn. Uh, he was told by the conductor he was in the wrong car. He had to go to the colored car. And he said, no, I paid my fare. Just like everybody else, I'm going to stay here. And he had done this frequently. And, and the conductors had just sort of, well, this conductor was determined to force this guy, this uppity guy to, to go. So the conductor got another uh, member of the railroad personnel. And, and the two of them tried to lift Frederick out of the seat, okay? But remember, he was a big man and a strong man. And uh, he hung on so firmly, they couldn't get him out of the seat. And so they unscrewed the seat from the floor and picked up the seat with Frederick still in it and carried it out onto the platform and set him down. And then the train left. As far as I'm concerned, he had won the day. I'd like to end uh, with one more excerpt from yet another book. He died in 1895. He was 77. He died just shortly after his Valentine's Day birthday. He thought he was 78, but he was 77. And uh, the next day, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the woman's suffrage campaigner, read about his death in the newspaper, and she wrote this in her diary. And here's where I'd like to close. Taking up the papers today, the first word that caught my eye touched me to the very soul. Frederick Douglass is dead. What memories of the long years since he and I first met chased each other thick and fast 
through my mind and held me spellbound. I recall his burning eloquence before a Boston anti-slavery meeting when with wit, satire, and indignation, he graphically described the bitterness of slavery and the humiliation of subjection to those who in all human virtues and powers were inferior to himself. It was the first time I had seen Douglas. Around him sat the great anti-slavery orators of the day, earnestly watching the effect of his eloquence on that immense audience that, that laughed and wept by turns, completely carried away by the wondrous gifts of his pathos and humor. For me, all the other speakers seemed tame after Frederick Douglass. He stood there like an African prince, majestic in his wrath. I wondered that any mortal should have ever tried to subjugate a being with such talents and love of liberty. And now for the support of this congregation and its work, the morning offering will be gratefully received and I hope freely given. We come to our time for sharing joys and concerns. If there's something on your mind or in your heart you'd like to share, we invite you to do so. The theory is that a, a joy shared is multiplied and a concern or sorrow shared is divided. Um, Donald will bring you the microphone so we can all hear. Yeah, 
Could we join please in our closing hymn number 348, Guide My Feet. be a religion that like sunshine goes everywhere its temple all space its shrine 
the good heart, its creed, all truth, its ritual works of love. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.